It's a time that's gone now, fading from our memory. But what a time it was, a time of empire. A time that saw three million Englishmen tumble out of their cottages and tenements, their barracks and palaces to colonize the world. Not before or since has any country embraced a craze the way the British embraced their empire. Believing above all that God was an Englishman, they took their language, their democracy, their law to the very ends of the earth. And in the service of such an empire, there emerged men who would become legends. Dr. Livingston on the shores of Lake Tanganyika, General Gordon martyred at Khartoum, Baden Powell besieged at Mafking. On and on they went, deeds of valor and glory beyond mere imagination. And together they helped to build the largest empire the world has ever seen. An empire in which 40 million Englishmen held sway over almost one third of the world's population. An empire which at its height boasted more than four dominions, eight protectorates, 40 possessions, and in the words of the colonial office, nearly all the isolated rocks and islands of all the oceans of the world. Was it any wonder that Cecil Rhodes could write, to be born British is to win first prize in the lottery of life. Even so, in the final account, every empire is built on force. Every empire depends on conquest. Every empire is retained only by unwavering will. This is a story of that empire, a story of unwavering will, the story of three men. Harold Larwood, English, the son of a coal miner born into poverty in Nuncargate, Nottinghamshire. Donald George Bradman, born and raised in the Australian bush, the man who became a hero to his nation. And Douglas Jardine, a child of the British Raj, born in India, educated in England, surrounded all his life by affluence and power. As only the Empire could conspire to do, these men came together in January 1933 in the small Australian city of Adelaide, that town of churches, there to do battle. They faced each other down 22 yards of carefully tended turf to play cricket, the hallowed game of empire. But suffer no illusion. In the guise of a game, this was as bitter as any war. It was to consume honor, tradition and friendship. It was about a young nation, Australia, emerging at last from beneath England's shadow. It was about the empire breaking apart. To this day, Douglas Jardine remains the most hated man ever to set foot in Australia. They said he was dangerous, ruthless, a man obsessed. In time, his own country would reject him but the private man was far removed from the public image. He could be charming, loyal, affectionate. He knew fear and he conquered it. He was a man who wanted to write his will across the sky and stars. I know because I loved him. To understand you have to go back to that shining jewel of empire, to India, to his childhood. The year is 1909, the place, Bombay. The occasion, a gala ball celebrating young Douglas's birthday. But contrary to appearances, this is anything but a happy occasion. For within days, nine-year-old Douglas Jardine is going to leave home forever. The Honourable Sir Weavers Randall Rogers, Registrar General, Rajasthan. I got you a mongoose, but Mama said gentlemen don't keep them. It's a boring old culling box. A sad time for you, Alice. Yes. And how are you bearing up? Well, not too badly. In public, anyway. 
Why don't you and Rachel run along? Rachel might like to see your presents. I've had nine years to prepare for this. Poppy can't. I don't believe any mother worthy of the name can prepare for it. Perhaps not. But Malcolm says that only English schools produce English gentlemen. Of course. And only English schools produce a modern scholar. His Excellency, the Lord Howis. Thank you, my lord. Not at all, not at all. How good of you to come. I'm sure it will be a pleasure as always. Now, where's the guest of honour? Hmm? Douglas. Lord Harris, may I present my son Douglas? Douglas, I'd like you to meet Lord Harris, the finest governor Bombay's ever had. And what's that you're wearing? It's my father, sir. It's a Harlequin cap. You wear it when you play cricket. Oh, do you now? And do you know what it means? It means that, that you've played cricket for Oxford, sir. Yes, yes, that's quite right. But it means more than that. It means that you're a, a member of the most honoured class in England. It means that you're a leading player in the Empire's greatest game. Did you have one, sir? Were you a cricketer? I've played the odd social game. Lord Harris is teasing you, Douglas. Not only did he captain England, he introduced cricket into India. Well, one had to civilise the place somehow. Do you want a harlequin cap for yourself one day? Yes, sir. That's the spirit. There now. Happy birthday. Don't stand on ceremony. Go ahead and open it. Go on. Open it. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Douglas. Oh, very good. Very good shot, Master Douglas, sir. Ready, ready. Ha. What have I told you about the late cut? Keep the ball down. And roll the wrists. What was that? Uh, that, my darling, was a four. I think it's time for stumps. Off to bed. Good night, my darling. Good night, mother. I don't forget, Horace Hill is a cricketing school. That's one of the reasons why we chose it, wasn't it? Most of the fellows there will play the game, and a, a new chap can win their respect and friendship by his ability with the bat. We know that, don't we? And by the way he plays the game. Now, once more, what did I tell you about a late cat? Roll your wrists and keep the ball down. Good boy. And Douglas, remember? What, Father? Everything. And so, like thousands of boys before him, the sons of those who helped to build the empire, Douglas found himself alone in an alien world. Horace Hill, like most English public schools, believed that a gentleman's education was built not only on scholarship, but on discipline. Housemaster, Caps! This is Douglas Jardine. He's from India. No beds at the end, eh, boy? Jardine. Where's he from? 
India. What is today? Cricket. And in the months that followed, Douglas would learn little about any subject except loneliness. Even cricket, the game which he'd once loved, held no interest for him now. By the end of that first term at Horace Hill, it seemed that Douglas, far from being one of the Empire's elite, would be yet another of its victims. But then, just when the night had never seemed more lonely, Douglas learned, every ocean has its shore, every night its dawn. I think I've caught you out. Which one of you would be Douglas Jardy? Ah, oh, how do you do, Douglas? I knew your His father. name was Andrew Lang, and had been a close friend of Douglas's grandparents. Though he was now over 70, he had no hesitation in inviting the young boy to spend the holidays with him in Scotland. In years to come, Douglas would say that it was a summer that changed his life. Apart from a gentle sense of humor, Andrew Lang was also blessed with a lively mind. He was a man whose interests knew no bounds, but his passion was cricket. That's good. You have a bowler's arm. But knowing your father, I guess you're even better with a bat. Did he ever tell you the secret of cricket? No, sir. Most people think it's just batting and bowling. You take that boy at school. He's twice your size. He thinks the secret is strength. Cricket's about none of those things. Cricket's about thinking. You don't bowl at the stumps or the bat. You study the batsman and you bowl at the man. Not at his body. You bowl at his mind, to his weaknesses. You see, Douglas, you don't bowl a man out. You think him out. Come on, I'll race you. It was a lesson Douglas would never forget. With his spirit rekindled by Andrew Lang, Douglas returned to school anxious to put into practice the old man's advice. He took to the field with a newfound determination, for the first time revealing a talent which took both pupils and teachers by surprise. And as success followed success, so with it came the respect and friendship of his classmates. By the end of the season, he was the school's best batsman. The following year, the captain of the team. Quite an achievement at a school renowned as a cradle for some of England's greatest cricketers. By the time he left Horace Hill, graduating to one of England's great public schools, his reputation with the bat went before him. But that carefree summer, the summer of 1914 was engulfed by tragedy. They called it the war to end all wars. By 1919, the British Empire alone had sacrificed the lives of a million men. Nothing in the world would ever be the same again. And the years had wrought their changes in other ways. Douglas Jardine was tall and athletic now, almost aristocratic in appearance. His manner forged by public schools and loneliness was reserved. But behind it, there lay an amazing self-reliance, a fierce determination. By the time his parents returned to live in England, Douglas was being hailed as one of the country's best college captains. But like so many colonial families at the time, the Jardines met again as strangers. so tall. More handsome than your father. I should think so. And Captain of Winchester. Your father's so proud. Thank you. We both are. All those years ago, your father was right. I so wanted to keep you. But look at you. A gentleman, a fine education. From what I hear, you play cricket the way I wanted to. Douglas, the world is before you. Oxford next, the law, partnership in a good firm, I envy you. Well, there's no need for that. According to the head, if we don't beat Eton tomorrow, none of us will have a future. Oh, good man, well, we didn't travel 8,000 miles to see you lose. That's the bat you gave him in Bombay. 
Afternoon, Percy. Uh, my respects, my lord. Uh, respect <laughs> is not that young man's long suit. Strangely dressed. Is it just affectation? No, oh, no, no, I don't think so. No, most people consider the captain of Surrey to be quite mad. Just thank God he didn't bring his damn banjo. Oh! Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well. They're just changing over. <laughs> Winchester's made a great start. Their captain's a very fine batsman. First man in, last man out. Now it's Eaton's turn to bat. He's moving too far down his wicket. I'll warn him. Don't do that. Run him out. But it's customary to give a warning. I'm not on the village green now. I'll run him out. Warning. They should have warned the batsman by showing him the ball before they ran him out. Mrs. Jardine, you'll have to speak to David. Can't have that sort of thing. Do you remember Lord Harris? Well done. And of course you've heard of Plum Warner, former captain of England, and now well known as the Prime Minister of Cricket. It's a great honour. A great day for Winchester. Congratulations. Yes. Very convincing win. Thank you, my lord. A pity about that run-out. The bowler should have warned him. I agree with Plum. I think the conventions of the game are just as important as the rule. <laughs> if I'd been captain today... You'd have lost the match. Ah, Mr. Fander. <laughs> May I introduce my son? Douglas, this is Mr. Fender, captain of Surrey. How do you do? Well done. Fine batting, good fielding and a daring tactic. You don't think it was wrong? <laughs> not at all. I was Eaton's number one bat. If you're in town, give me a call. They may not play that way at Middlesex, but we certainly do at Surrey. I like this style. Mrs. Jardine? Mr. Fender. I must run. You should know, Douglas, in spite of what Mr. Fender says, your father and I have never played that way. For some of us, cricket is more than just a game. Douglas. Come in, come in. Mr. Fender. Ah, thank you. Well, I was delighted to get your call. How long have you been in town? Uh, just two days. Ah. Ah. Yes. Someone once said that there are only three rules to modern life. Never play cards with a man called Doc. Never sleep with anyone whose troubles are worse than your own. And never, whatever else you may do, drink anything unless it's French champagne. Cheers. Cheers. Well, tell me about your future. Um, yes? Well, Oxford first, and then mm -hmm. the law, and hopefully a chance to play for a good county team. And you're thinking of Surrey. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. Well, eventually, it has an outstanding record. 
And then what? Play for your country? Chance to open for England? If I was good enough. Top flight cricket breaks most men. You walk out on the field, your name on 40,000 lips. You take guard, your heart pounding. Sprinting towards you is one of the world's great bowlers. Only one thought in his head to destroy you. Skilled batsmen. In their time, the best schoolboys in the land have stood there paralyzed. But a few men, the elite of the game, thrive on it. They hunger for the risk. They can, they can dance on the edge. And that is the difference between a good batsman and a test cricketer. I wonder, what do you want? I want to play for England. Well, don't dream about it. Live for it. Now, do well at Oxford. Have a good career to support your amateur status. But play like a professional. Find. Find that state of mind. Now, I suspect you've got the temperament for it. You're calm, almost arrogant. And it took courage to run out that Eton batsman. And that's what you'll need most of. Courage. Well, good luck. Don Bradman, 100, not out. My name's Jessie Menzies. Hi. I'm going to be staying here. Hi. Only during the week. My mum's inside. What's wrong with your house? Nothing. It's got its own orchard and creek. But it's at Glen Quarry. There's no school there. Can you play cricket? At last year, she got a blue ribbon for embroidery. Yeah, but cricket's much harder. Can't take her off the ball, not even for a second. Do you want to count for me? See if I can get past ten. One. grown men. It's half an hour to closing time. George, what have you got to lose? Go on then. Thanks, Dad. I won't let you down. Time's up. You'll have to declare. There you go, young fella. Thanks. You be careful. I'll be right, Mum. You wear this. Oh, Mum. You want to play with the men, you wear what the men wear. What am I supposed to do? Bowl underarm? Just bowl him out and then get to the pub. Come in a bit closer. Could be a bit risky. Look at that. It's only 20 minutes to closing time. Have a beer. 
Dublin, Larwood. There's another four puncture over me. Dublin, nothing. You can't do it again. playing tomorrow, Harold? It's awful. How much will you be getting? Seven and six. Then you can buy pints tonight. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that looked fast. I wouldn't know. I didn't see it. You can take me a moment to settle in. That's what Fender said. a new fast bowler. Congratulations, Arthur. See? You said you'd win. Two pounds? You said I'd be out for a duck. Two pounds. Thank you. And a pound for every Larwood wicket. Five? Yes. Well done, Harold. Fastest bowler in England. In the world. What do I owe you, Harold? Seven and six, Skipper. Yeah. Have a pound. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Very brisk. Thanks, Mr. Jardine. Not much past the trot today, though. But you can bowl faster. Oh, I. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's wait until we're on the same team. Mm. Cheers. I think cricket's a game for overgrown schoolboys. Huh. Well, I once heard it described as a game in which you have two sides. One out on the field and one in. Each man that's on the side that's in goes out, and when he's out, he comes back in, and the next man goes in until he's out. When they're all out, the side that's been in goes out and tries to get those coming in out. When both sides have been in and out, that's including the not-outs, well, that's the end of the game. Exactly. It defies intelligent analysis. As mysterious as any ritual of Hottentot, and just as primitive, except, of course, to its devotees. I can't understand how grown men can take it so seriously. Mm. And uh, what do you do, Miss? I work at the British Museum. Ah. A secretary? An Egyptologist. And you? The law is my living, cricket is my life. And for which school do you play? Try and stop this thing. Find the brakes. Next to the throne, Cricket is one of the greatest links of empire. 
I'm not talking about imperialism. I'm talking about boredom. Ah, oh, but don't you see? On the field, the batsman is never sure what sort of ball he'll be facing. Off spin, leg spin, full toss, yorker. A what? A yorker. Oh, a yorker. That's a ball bowled right at the batsman's feet. But whatever the ball, the batsman only has a split second in which to decide what stroke he'll play. A drive, a hook, defensive or offensive, forward or back, he can do whatever he likes, but he must always conduct himself within the rules. It's an ordered world, but there's always the risk of the unexpected. And that's why many people, intelligent people, believe that cricket is a metaphor for life. <coughs> oh, really? Nobody can make a judgment unless there's been a fair trial. Come to a match. I'll think about it. You look very lovely. Oh. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Oh, when you're young and falling in love, you do such foolish things. My mother followed my father from one diplomatic post to the next. I went Edith, to a cricket match. My father, Edith Clark. How do you do? The year was 1926. Once again, England was playing its arch rival, Australia. That's England batting. They wear the blue cap. Percy George says you're one of the finest batsmen in England. Yes, and so he is. Oh, why isn't he out there, then? Why, indeed. Ah, uh, well, England has a score of great batsmen. Only five or six make the team. Now, I have to prove that I am outstanding. And you think you can? Are you that talented? Ah, uh, well, it's not just a matter of talent. As Percy says himself, it's more a state of mind. As most men can't survive out there. What about his state of mind? Oh, I think when Douglas wants something. He's bloody determined. <laughs> ah. Oh, damn. Clean bow. What a ridiculous shot. Edith could have done better. It's very kind of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, what happens to the batsman now? Well, he goes back to the dressing room. Nobody says a word. Now, he probably places his bat rather firmly on the floor and then thinks and thinks about the shot he should have played. <laughs> For the rest of the match. <laughs> Good Lord, no, no. In cricket, unlike life, the players get a second chance. Both sides bat twice, and when they have, the team with the most number of runs wins. Wins. <laughs> and now that the English have batted, it's the Australians. And we can have our picnic. Runs into the fence, it's a four. If it goes over the fence on the full, it's six rounds. And when the Australians score, all that's needed is polite applause. I even mastered the concept of the ashes. As Douglas never wearied of pointing out, cricket originated in England. But in 1882, a team from Australia toured England and actually defeated us. The next day, a notice appeared in the Sporting Times announcing the death of English cricket. And somebody cremated some bales, and ever since then, whenever the two teams meet, there's a battle royal for what's known as the Ashes. Has cricket always been part of your marriage? All my life. My brothers and father were mad about it. And you, you never took an interest. After I married Malcolm, I tried, but with little success. I decided then, whenever he spoke about cricket, I'd close my eyes and think of England. Yes, he's almost as old as I am. You should have been there. The look of horror on the faces of the Australians. Love was Loved. He has scarcely had the ball left his hand, and yet another frightful Australian was on his way back to the pavilion. All out for 125. 125? Champagne. Oh, yes, champagne. I should have thought black coffee. Uh, no, no, champagne. We've invited a couple of people back. 
Yes, just one or two. Ah. Ah. <laughs> My father always used to say, if you're looking for a decent, fast bowler, go down the nearest coal mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's to Larwood. Oh, Larwood. Ah, Jardine, where's that son of yours? Oh, he's, uh, he's... There. <laughs> ah, oh, he has turned into a fine young man. A fine batsman, too. <laughs> yes. Oh, now look, I don't think I'm talking out of turn, but there's a feeling at law that it's about time he had a run for his country. That would be a great honor. The captain, three cheers for the captain. Give him, give him, give him. There must be nothing quite like it. Victory. To strive, to seek, to find and not to yield. And while Douglas dreamed of captaining England, far away in Australia, there was another young man with a dream of his own. Don Bradman would not only play for his country, he would shatter the world of English cricket forever. Will you hurry up? It's almost knock-off time. Do you like these William Sykes? Have you got one with a shorter handle? I don't know who you think you are. Victor Trumper. His name's Don Bradman. I suggest you remember that. Yeah, that's what all their mothers say. Don't forget little Johnny. He's going to play for Australia. That's the one. Happy birthday, son. Thanks, Mum. Don't be worried. He'll be all right. Oh, he's like. Hello, Jesse. Hello, Hello. Happy birthday. Thanks. I want to get your kit back. I couldn't afford it. <laughs> well, Jesse, it's um, just what I need. Lovely, really. <laughs> it makes the full set of a dozen now. Don, there's a letter here for you from the Cricket Association. I've been selected to play for New South Wales. <laughs> it's the Sheffield Shield side. We'll be playing against Queensland and Victoria and all the other states. Your association has decided to select some of these you to boys. play. They're test cricketers. It'll be a great experience. It will not. It'll I be a stunning day both. You will give this matter the consideration its importance warrants. The state team's only one step away from playing for Australia. If you get into that league, I reckon you can make a living out of cricket. Those boys get 30 pounds a match, plus good expenses. That's more than 10 weeks' wages. Yeah. And there's five matches. It's a whole year's salary in a season. And then if you tour overseas, it's a lot more, they reckon. 500 quid. And then there's endorsements. If you're a test cricketer, you can put your name to bats and boots. Might even get a column in the newspaper. Yeah. We'll have to see how I go with a state team. I reckon I could hammer out a bit of a future with a bat. It'd be a bad life. It'd be a great life. Morning, all. Oh, morning, Percy George. Oh, I think I'll give up the wine business. This, uh, this journalism's a real lark. Easiest money a man ever made. Well, it'd have to be easier than convincing. As all you do is uh, phone up your friends, 
have a bit of a chat. And then you phone this fellow called the news editor. He's a frightfully nice chap. You see? Mm. When I gave him my news this morning, he said, Fender, you've got the best contacts in the business. Well, till then, I thought contact was something you made with a young woman. And what did he say to that? He said, this is a scoop. <laughs> well, I almost laughed. I thought for a moment he was going to say, hold the front page. But he didn't. No, no, evidently they only do that in the case of a royal death or war. No, uh, my news didn't rate. No? No. D.R. Jardine selected to play for England. And tour Australia. George! George! Thank you, sir. Now, you go and get some glasses, George. Yes. You know the shape? Yes, I know. Yes, sir. I don't believe it. Are you sure? Chapman's the skipper. Sutcliffe, Hammond, Larwood, of course, and you. I have the whole team. Who from? Never you mind. And so then the news editor says to me, how would you like to go to Australia and cover the tour? We'll be travelling together. I told you he was a nice chap. Hey! George, get yourself a glass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well done, George. How long will you be away? Six months. When do you leave? Not for four weeks yet. It's a pity there are no pyramids in Australia. <laughs> I'll miss you. I'll miss you too. My mother gave me this when I left India. She said if I ever got lonely, all I had to do was to wave. No matter how far, she'd see. Bloody bags. Welcome to Australia. Go on. Go home, you pommy bastard. Don't buy them. You might catch some.
Well, it isn't exactly Lord's, is it? <laughs> don't forget about where you are. And don't worry about the heat. Those damn flies. Ah. Ah, this is test cricket. Now, remember what I told you. Block out everything. Find that state of mind. Good luck, dear. That'll be Don Bradman, caught from the bush. He's got quite an impressive record. Aye, he's never played England. No, we'll take him, Mr. Jardine. We'll have him for dinner. Harold Larwood was right. In his test debut, Don Bradman would fail. Good luck, son. Thanks, Dad. But he would emerge stronger, more determined than ever. Within four years, Don Bradman would be the best batsman in the world, a sporting hero to his nation. Morning, Mr. Jardine. Good morning, Mr. Bradman. By then, Harold Larwood would be the most feared fast bowler in the world, and Douglas Jardine would be captain of England. The men that made Bodyline were on their way. <laughs>